Come on, go ahead and celebrate. Go one more time. You know, we live in a world and in a time where people put their trust in so many different things. But Psalm 20 and verse 7 says, some trust in chariots, some in horses. But guess what? Our trust is in the name of the Lord our God. In other words, our confidence is in the Lord. Am I right? I'd like for you to tell your neighbor, neighbor, my confidence is in the Lord. Put those hands one more time for Jesus. I wanna face my giant 
I want to face my giants with confidence. Lord, I want to face my giants with confidence. Oh, God, yes, I want to face. Are you ready? One, two, three, and I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the world. Won't stop until I see them fall. I'm gonna stand up, step out when you call me Jesus, Jesus. I wanna hear you. I want a heart like David, Lord be my defense, I want to face my child. Sing it up. How you want to face your child? Raise it. The more you sing it, the more it becomes a reality. Sing it one more time, say. With confidence. Come on, go ahead and celebrate it one more time. Come on. Hallelujah. Uh, is somebody gaining confidence to face your giant? I said, are you gaining confidence to face your giant? If you're that kind of person here today, I want you to put your hands together. Celebrate the elevation place of praise. Powerful, 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 powerful ministrations. Praise God. Can you hear me tell your neighbor, say, giants exist because they are giant killers. Tell your neighbors, say, I'm a giant killer. After the order of David. Now, if you're not familiar with the scriptures, you may not understand what we're talking about, but I'm sure almost everybody who knows anything at all about the scriptures should know the story of David and Goliath. All right? Yeah, even people who have never been to church before know that it's a David and a Goliath. Epic story in the scriptures. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. But you know what amazed me the most is recently studying uh, 2 Samuel 21, I think from verse 19, and I think in 2 Chronicles or somewhere again, realizing that David brought down Goliath and he set up another standard or benchmark uh, for other people to follow. It was not only David that killed a giant in the scriptures. Yeah. See there, 2 Samuel 21 and verse 19. And again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines and where Elanan, the son of Jarel, origin, the Bethlehemite killed the brother of Goliath, the Gigai, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And you know, I can go on and on. All the guys around David killed the brothers of Goliath. And one, one of the brothers of Goliath, if you study it very well, his description was more terrifying than Goliath. Yeah. And David's guys brought down all those people. So 
Slaying the giant is not the exclusive preserve of some people. It's for everybody. Yeah. And you need to name the giant because your own giant's name may not be Goliath. It may be unemployment. <laughs> your own giant's name, may, you know, may just be access to finance. Your own giant's name may just be marital bliss or marital unrest. <laughs> and you have, to slay, you have to bring it down. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. You have to bring it down. This is the season where you should just be willing to say enough is enough. Enough is enough. This giant also will come down. I pray for somebody today as you go into this new week, your confidence will no longer shake. Amen. You will not lose courage amen. in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Oh, I'm not hearing that amen loud enough. Amen. Someone online, I said, I pray for you that your confidence will not fail. Amen. Your courage will not diminish amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. What you turned away from before that has been credited into your destiny, you will no longer turn away from them. Amen. You will bring down your giant with confidence. Amen. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Somebody blessed again to be in church today. I wanted to put your hands together and celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. What a joy to be in God's presence. And I want to welcome everyone joining us online. I wanted to put distractions away from you as we get into the word of God today. The Bible says that he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions. And another uh, scripture says the same word that was preached to us was preached to them, but because it was not mixed with faith in them that had it, it did not profit them. So the word of God must meet with faith in your heart. It's wanting to be in church, to be present in church physically. is another thing to be fully present and ready to engage the word of God. And if you are online also, it's time to take distractions away from you. Yeah, this time is not a time to just flip through your handheld device and uh, check in emails that are stale. Yeah, when you get back, well, after now, you can prepare for Monday, all right? Uh, this is not the time to be replying messages. God wants to send you a message. Listen to that one. He's the most important person in the universe. Yeah, not your boss. So if your boss sends you a message right now, your boss should wait for the boss of all bosses. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, that's the person who have come to worship and we must give our full attention. Full attention. Praise God. Uh, the other week, week before, last week was made for more. So the week before, we, we preached a message that was wrapping up the teaching series for this month entitled uh, the, the, the Spirit of a Pioneer. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking the second part of that message today, the Spirit of a Pioneer, uh, and I've titled this, What's Driving You? What's Driving You? By the way, today is uh, Pulpit Exchange Sunday, so I kind of am twisted the pastors to be able to preach this morning. I'm not supposed to be preaching uh, because I don't have a, a parish. I don't have an expression. So all the pastors from different expressions, local expressions, six expressions here in Lagos are exchanging pulpit today. So our resident pastor is currently teaching now in Greater Lekki Church. The Greater Lekki Church pastor is on the mainland at Maryland preaching. Uh, pastor of Maryland, I think, is in the Ikorodu. Life Point pastor is in the Koi. Uh, Ikorodu pastor is in Life Point. Pastor Kola Fayemi, who is here from the Koi, brought us the word in first service. So I'm twisted him and took this service from me. <laughs> praise God. <laughs> I said, praise God. It was supposed to be a Sunday for me to just sit and watch things happen. Yeah, but because next Sunday I'm, I'm in London church, I said, let me, let me see be relevant to this house today. Is that okay? <laughs> I said, is that okay? Pastor Kola, by the way, brought us a powerful word in the first service. Can you please appreciate him? Yeah, yeah, it was powerful powerful word. What's driving you? The part two of the pioneer spirit. We have explained the spirit of a pioneer 
gets you on your feet, makes you bootstrap, make you think and view things differently. It gives you the notion and the idea that a pioneer don't, does not see things the way they are, but the way they can be. Yeah. A pioneer does not see people, place, and things the way they are, but the way they can be. So when a pioneer sees someone, he sees potentials ready to be unleashed in the right direction. The work of a pioneer is to allow, I mean, to make that potential unleashed in the right direction. A pioneer does not see things the way they are, things, people, places, the way they are, they see things the way they can be. A man who is a pioneer, who has engaged the spirit of a pioneer in his home, does not see the family or the marriage the way it is right now. He sees it. He, I mean, even the woman who has embraced the spirit of a pioneer will see the marriage the way it can be. And drive things in that direction. Aligning with God to make things happen. A pioneer does not see a small business the way it is, but the way it can be. So people, places, things, when God plants you there and gives you the Holy Spirit, which is a pioneering spirit, the Holy Spirit gives you the power of vision. Because the language of the Spirit is visions and dreams. Yeah. That's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. It paints pictures to us to see beyond what the ordinary eye can see. So that we're seeing from his own scope. That's the oppression of the spirit of a pioneer. But as we embrace the spirit of a pioneer, it's important to ask ourselves the question, what drives me? What is driving you? From what perspective am I seeing? How am I interpreting things around me? What is my greatest motivation, you know, for doing things? I mean, P.K. Was, was saying in the other service that, uh, you know, people sometimes just find out that they're losing motivation for things. You know, when you call your boss on Monday morning and says, can't make it today, something happened, and then by Wednesday you are feeling like not going to work again. Something is wrong. Yeah. And there are some people... A lot has happened this season. You just realize that you are losing interest in the things that used to interest you seriously. Yeah. So you have a lot of unfinished businesses, unfinished thought, unfinished things. Everything is just like undone around you because you're just putting things aside. And there's no better time to face your fears and gain confidence in God to push things through than this time. But you must have the right standpoint for everything that you do in the sense of understanding where is this coming from? Am I having the right motivation, the right drive to make this thing happen? And there are many things that seek to drive us this season. This is a season where people feel there's not enough in the world. So many people are driven by the quest for acquisition. Just acquire more. Save more for the rainy day, you know, and all that. So, but it's important to note that God wants our hearts to be right. That's the center of our motivation, our heart. He wants it to be right. And when the heart is not right, our interpretations will be wrong. Let me read from 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, I mean 6 and 7, 1 Samuel 16, 6 and 7 from the New Living Translation. This was a man adjured by God as a prophet to his people, Samuel by name, a prophet in Israel. And it was a time to anoint a king over Israel, and God sent him to the house of a man called Jesse. This is just to say that you can be on a God-given assignment, but your interpretations may be wrong, your motive may be wrong, your drive may be wrong, what is driving you. So Samuel got to the house of Jesse, the Bible says in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 16, when they arrived, that's Jesse sent for his sons. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Yeah. 
But the Lord said to Samuel, and why did he do that? He saw Eliab. Eliab looked like it. Yeah. Frame and everything, biceps. It, it, it looked kingly. Or somebody who would be able to rescue Israel from their oppressors. So, but the Bible says here, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. The heart is a center of motivation. What Samuel was seeing was different from what God is seeing. The goal is to anoint a king for Israel. Somebody here, you have set your goal, and we understand, and maybe the goal is even in alignment with God's goal. But the process, the how, that's what I'm speaking to today. The how, how you are going about achieving your goal. How we go about achieving our goals. Somewhere here, wanted to achieve this process with the wrong motivation or the wrong understanding of the situation. Let me give you another example about Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. When you read Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1, we call it the temptations of Jesus. Give me a New King James Version. Matthew chapter 4, quickly, quickly. Matthew chapter 4. I hope somebody's following me today. I said, are you, I, hope, I hope you are following me. Can you hear me ask your neighbor one more time, say, what's driving you? In this passage, Jesus was about to be driven by certain things. And thank God, he quickly realized and made a reverse. Let's, let's look at it. So the Bible says then, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Verse 2, quickly. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now, let me elucidate on that a little bit before I read verse 3. After he has fasted 40 days and 40 nights, it was a season of 40 days of denial of certain things that made him feel human. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Fasting is denying yourself of certain things deliberately. That's the whole big deal about fasting. The need for food had become heightened. The need for many other things that made him comfortable had become heightened. In the season that we're living in right now, certain needs for some people, the need for self-expression has become heightened. That's why you want to just leave your job. Start something. Some people, the need for peace has become heightened. And it looks like I'm not getting peace in this marriage. So I fire the woman and marry another one. All right? Yeah. And it's not only women. At least in the last week, I've had to speak to one or two. I mean, it's not only men, sorry. I've had to speak to one or two women who wanted to fire their husband also. So it's okay. Yeah, even up to last night, I see they don't. Yeah. So it's okay. I'm not, I'm not biased in that regard. In fact, these days, hiring and firing as regards marriage is not the exclusive preserve of any gender. Yes. We have seen, everything has changed. COVID brought a lot of changes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Men are firing people. <laughs> men, I mean, men are firing women, women are firing men. It's just, however COVID had gone, whoever is more empowered right now can call the shot. Yeah. Praise God. People's needs are becoming more heightened. You know, you feel it more. I want to do this. I need this. I want that. Jesus was in that frame. And then the devil showed up. In verse 3, there now, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that this stone become bread. Jesus had the power to turn stone to bread. The devil cannot tempt you with what you cannot do. I'll sit together. If it's not within your power, there's no temptation. Yeah. Like we say, the reason why some people are not committing adultery is because they cannot afford it. No, that's the truth. You know, when, when you are empowered, 
your option for sin is expanded. <laughs> because the devil does not tempt you with what you cannot afford. Yeah. Somebody can wake up tomorrow morning if you can buy a brand new car, different one, the devil will tempt you. Say, buy that car now. You can afford it. But if the devil brings that temptation to you, you know what you're saying. So you, say, you just laugh and just walk up. Because <laughs> you know you are can't balance. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. So that's the same thing here. The devil came and tempted him to turn the stone to eat. The devil knew that he needed bread. And he had the power to, to, to fast track the process. The only thing is, Jesus said, no. I'm not going to allow you to drive me. I have my inner driver. Yeah. That's why he said, man shall not live by bread alone. Quoting from Deuteronomy 8 and verse 5 or so, where it said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus was saying, I have chosen to be driven by the word of God, not your words. And not the quest to meet my personal needs. Are you still with me today? One of the greatest lessons I've learned recently is that one of the greatest investments that I can that anyone can make in themselves or the greatest investment you can make in life is the investment you make in your, into your character. Can I say that one more time? So one of the greatest investment that you can make in life is the investment that you are making into your character. I thought I have a slide for that. Put it on. Perhaps somebody wants to save it. You know, put it on. Uh, uh, whoever is sitting on that thing it should be Alive and well, all right? Quickly, yeah. Be driven, all right? <laughs> One of the greatest investment that you can make in life is the investment you make into your character, your character, your character, your character. Because it's the center of everything. It's the center of everything. It's the, it's, Everything rises and falls on it. At this point, if Jesus did not have the presence of mind and enough character to be able to say no to the devil, as driven as he was, he will, he, 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 he will want this thing to happen very fast. God is more interested in our character than in our competence. It's, uh, and is more invested in who we are becoming than what we are achieving. God is more interested in whom I'm becoming than what I'm achieving. Yeah. And, and he's more interested in my character. So, because God is more interested in my character than my competence or what I, what I, whatever I have, then my own greatest investment in my life should be in my character. Then next to that is my competence. We have many competent Destroyers. Many competent people who are causing wrecking havoc everywhere. Some of the people that have destroyed industries the most are competent people without character. Yeah. Competent people without character. They run an organization to this level and then the, all the temptations start to come. And because they don't have any foundation in character, they destroy, and people are built with them. So people have invested 20 years. Yeah. They are coconut head. <laughs> will just spring into action. <laughs> and then it, everything just starts, you know. People lost their pension, lost all kinds of things just because of people who have invested greatly in competence and almost zero investment in character. Families have been destroyed because of very competent people who lack character. So you see people build marriages for 30 years. And somebody who has never invested in his or her character will mess everything up and the marriage will go crumbling. I don't care how competent you are. I value competence. I try to develop myself on a daily basis. But the greatest investment that you can make in your life is the investment that you make in your character. Is somebody still with me today? Yeah. And that's where you know 
what is driving you. You have been able to put it in perspective. Everyone's life is driven by something. And, you know, in this day and age that we're living in, some people are driven by pressure, driven by problem, driven by deadlines, driven by, you know, painful memories. I think I need to pause there to say something to somebody in this service whose major drive recently has been painful memories. Yeah. Somebody may be listening to me right now. Maybe something happened to your parents. Maybe to your mom. Maybe to your dad. You know, there are some people who are almost destroying their homes just simply because of uh, 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 their, 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 somebody's... Let me give you an example. Somebody's father got it wrong in marriage. Maybe the woman mistreated the man and da-da-da-da. And then you... I've made up your mind. No woman will do that to me. So you are so guarded. You can't trust your wife. Every move. It's like, hey, what's going on there? What's going on there? Are you investing money without me? Are you doing this without me? Before you know, you're breaking the marriage down, and it's a painful memory of what happened to your father that is haunting you right now. And it can be vice versa. So people are driven with, by all kinds of things. Painful memories, pressure, deadlines, guilt sometimes. Yeah. Driven by guilt, driven by anger, driven by resentment. But one thing that is certain is that we are all driven by something. I, I wanted to look at this while, while, while I was preparing for this and uh, knowing that I may be playing golf later today. This came to my mind. Do I have a camera on me? Yeah. You know, this ball will remain at this state of rest except a force comes to it. But in my little knowledge of golf, I just brought two of my, you know, clubs here. You see that they don't look the same. This is what we call driver in golf. This is actually, that's his name, which is why I remember driver. I said, I told her, I said, golfer, I shouldn't be pre preaching a message on what drives you. And I have my driver at home. I should bring my driver into the service. Because <laughs> this is what you call a driver. This is where you start a game of golf with mostly on many holes. This can drive the ball the farthest if you use it well. This is called a putter. It's just to move a ball in a small distance in a straight line to be able to get into the hole. If you use this to putt, you will never putt. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Because it is done in such a way to, to fling the ball. Yeah, and God help you if you find it. <laughs> but this one is more tempered. It's just, to, it's just to move the ball, you know, like I, like I want to hail that thing there. You know, this, this one is more suited, you know, for that purpose. You see what I'm saying? At least it's close. Because somebody may be saying, Pastor, is that you? It's close. Focus, focus, focus. Focus. If I use the other one, you will find it in Lucky Face One. See, if you don't know what is driving you, you can be displaced out of destiny. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Something can shift you out of your destiny. If you have not decided, this would drive me. That would drive me. Let me move very fast. Put my next slide on. Let me quickly explain something. Generally speaking, there are many human drives. But these five are important. These five are important. One is the drive to acquire or achieve which is the drive for success, for power, for influence. The devil came and tempted Jesus there in Matthew chapter 4 by the drive for acquisition when he says, look at all the kingdom of, of the world, the third temptation. He said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you everything. And Jesus said, I want everything, but not in your terms, but in my own terms. He said, it has been written. You shall not uh, worship any other God except your God. So I'm not going to worship you 
to get all these things, do I want it? And in the same vein, this is to tell somebody here today, you can read that in verse uh, 6 or 7 or 8 of Matthew chapter 4, where the devil took Jesus to the, you know, to the high place and says, look at everything. You see, some people think the reason why we serve God is to make money. So you won't show up at prayer meeting except there's miracle alert. <laughs> or it is about how we break through. Some people don't even understand that you can pray kingdom, you know, investment prayers where you pray the will of God to be done. That's why you don't pray for Nigeria. You don't pray for family members that are in trouble. Some people here, you have been in this church for five years, you've never opened your mouth one day to pray for your pastor. God will forgive you. <laughs> That's a joke, but you understand. In, in the middle of joke, we're saying something. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. There's something about you understanding that Christianity is more than a drive for acquisition. acquisition. Just having more and being okay. Because some people put that slide on the screen permanently. Please, permanent. Leave it there. Until I said, remove. Just leave it. Uh-huh. So some people are, you know, driven by acquisition. Some people, it's just the need to bond. Yeah. Relationship, approval, connection. The question today is how are you going about these legitimate drives? Because we must not lose our drive to acquire more. The only thing is how. We must not lose our drive, you know, for bonding, for relationship. But this one that you can bond with anything, it, 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 it can't be like that. Some people, I mean, another drive is the drive to learn new skill, new knowledge, wisdom, and all that. But the Bible talks about the wisdom of this world and the wisdom that is from above. People with devilish wisdom can get things done, but there will be collateral damage. Because the wisdom they are using is destructive. Also, some people are driven by the need to defend. So, to protect oneself, love one another, I mean, uh, uh, to, to protect oneself and all that, to repel danger, competition, and to shield and all that. So so that's another drive. And some people are driven to, you know, to feel. That's the desire for emotional experiences. People are driven like this. They are in parties every weekend. They just want, they just want a different emotional experience, like pleasure, excitement, adventure. Have you realized that Parties wear down some people where it energizes some people. Yeah. Some people can party from Monday to Sunday and they won't feel anything. Yeah. Some people cannot sit and party for two hours. They say, I want to go. The noise is too much. Everything is. So we're driven by different things. And a lot of these drives are legitimate. So these drives are in it, given to us to fulfill our destiny. Sometimes can be seasonal, some stronger than others at different stages of life. The early stage of life, for instance, some people have more drive to bond. Yeah. When you have bonded and bonded, you realize that life is not about just bonding only, then you slow yourself down. Yeah. Some people in their 60s and 70s now, they, they feel that they've had all the friends that they need in this world. So they're just maintaining friendship. They are careful about how to hide. And some people have done them evil, so they don't hide anyhow. But when you are young, you'll be hiding anyhow until you learn the rope. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So some of these things are seasonal. But the important thing that I want us to understand today is that the way we go about all these drives must be managed based on certain values. And those are kingdom values. So, I don't just want to achieve success. I know I have the spirit of a pioneer. I don't just want to break new grounds. How 
I go about breaking new ground is also important to God. Yeah. And how we go about all these things is a serious issue that depends on the state of our character. Yeah. Every self leader, everyone who, is self, who has engaged self leadership uh, with solid character is value driven. Value driven, value driven. So all these things are there as major drivers for life, but we need to subject them to certain values if we want our lives to turn out after the order of Christ. Is somebody still with me today? I said, are you still with me today? Yeah. If we want our lives to turn out after the order of Christ, then we must subject these things to Certain values. We want to be driven by certain values. We want to be driven by certain values. So don't be a boat without a sail, or a dog without a leash, or a sheep without a rudder. You have to be the kind of person that is driven, but driven by certain values. Within the context of certain values. So I, I want to achieve. I want to bond. I want to be excited. I want to have fun. But my phone, being a legitimate need, must be guided by certain values. Yeah. Must be guided by certain values. That's the crux of this message today. That all the different drives that we have identified are legitimate, but we cannot just be driven only by them. That was what Jesus pointed out in Matthew chapter 4. My drive for acquisition is legitimate. That's why the devil came to tempt me with it. My drive to meet my immediate needs for fun, for bonding, for whatever. That's, those needs were heightened after 40 days of fasting and denial. The devil says, you can turn this stone to bread. If you're a son of God, do it. Yeah. And Jesus said, no. There are certain values that guide how I use my power. And those values are called the word of God. So man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yeah, I want to be in a relationship because I value bonding. I want to connect. So we connect, connect, and then marry. But there are values that guide how I connect, who I connect with. Do it's a legitimate need. It's not good that man should be alone. That's what the scripture says. And God said, I will make him a helper that is suitable for him. But how that is going to happen must be guided by certain values. Yeah. Can you hear me look at your neighbor and say, I'm value driven? Value. Say, values drive me. Value. Say, scriptural values. Value. Godly values. Value. They drive me. Value. Glory be to Jesus. Value. So, the big question today is what are your personal values? What are your personal values? And are they scriptural? Are they based on the words of Christ? Because whether you like it or not, you are driven by some things. Yeah. There's no one that is living and breathing and doing life every day today that is not driven by something. The essence of being a disciple of Christ and being a member of a church like this, or a faith community like this, is for you to imbibe the values of Christ and then live it out in everyday life. You can carry the biggest Bible in Lagos or in Africa, as the case may be. But it does not mean that your life is driven by these values until you leave them out. Yeah. Can I shock you more? Prayer should temper you to be value-driven. But when all your prayers are driven by your need, it will not affect your character. Can I say that one more time? Prayer should temper you. Yeah, because it's intimacy with God. And God rubs off on us. And some of his values then get seeped into us and we understand the word of God more as we pray and become more intimate. But if every time I pray is driven by need, I will forget the impact that prayer and the word of God should have on my character. Because I think that anyhow it happens, God made it happen. Even if it happened in a in a way that is not in line with the word of God. 
That's why today, I mean, I say it all the time. People say that I was in Benin yesterday and still having some conversation. When people know that I'm a pastor, they always come to say, especially people who don't go to church, who are atheists, who are people, you know. I, I'm in certain space sometimes where it's not church. And that's where people want to pinch you as a pastor. Yeah. And say things like, somebody, I mean, an old man, older man was saying this uh, just this weekend, like I said, in Edo State, and it was like, when there were not this many churches in this country, we didn't have this many armed robbers. Uh, the country was safer. We we're not fighting each other. Uh, they, you know, he said, so what is now the use of all of you? <laughs> you can imagine somebody talking to me like that. He just be looking. Yeah. Finish, I'll say my own. Yeah. What is now the use? You know, he said, the more churches we have, the more problems we have. <laughs> Are these real issues? No, I can't hear you today. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like that sometimes? Yes. So it's, that old man is not wrong. So I'm not saying that he's criticizing the church. No. The, the point I'm driving at is that thank God for the church. The church has done a lot in this country and has kept our sanity to a large extent. Sometimes just coming to church is therapy. Yeah. So you don't lose it. Yeah. You know? And a lot of good things that churches Especially churches like ours are doing all over the place. But we need more of a certain kind of church where people gain the understanding that Christianity is not about using God. It's about God using you. Yeah. It's about God using you to fulfill his own purpose. Because your purpose, your personal purpose, driven by certain ambition, driven by your need, it's useless before God. The devil is going to leverage it. That's what he wanted to do with Jesus. He's going to leverage it to wreck havoc if you leave it in his hands. And some of our needs are legitimate. It's just that God wants to guide how you go about meeting those needs. So, in wrapping this all up in a few minutes, as a church, as the Elevation Church, we have what we call our own core values. This is the last message of this month, which is our anniversary month. I want everyone joining us online and everyone in this house today to recognize that if you are in the Elevation Church, you've not subscribed to Ashley, which is the acronym for our, uh, uh, our core values as a church, you are not really truly, fully integrated in the Elevation Church. Yeah. These are the values that guide and drive how we go about achieving what we want to achieve and meeting our legitimate needs. And they are all scriptural values. They drive us. They put boundaries. They are like guardrails around us. You know, if you're traveling on the bridge, any bridge for that matter, but here in Lagos, the Tottenham Bridge, which we're all familiar with, especially those of us in the room, and everyone joins from all around the world who has ever been to Lagos, Nigeria, you know Tom Milan Bridge. And you have a bridge in your city too. Guardrails are on both sides of the bridge so that you don't, you know, go off. Many people will prefer a life without guardrails. But as you know, if there are no guardrails on the edge of those things, many more people will have the tendency of driving off because they are free radicals. They don't want anything to hold them. They, they, you know, and you know young people listen to me. All this thing about do, do, do you, do you. <laughs> you know, have you heard that before? I do me, you do you, you know. Everybody just doing themselves. Yeah. In the name of freedom, right? But you, you should understand one thing. That you did not burn you. And he did not create you. Somebody created you. Yeah. And the person who created you has a purpose for your life. 
And that person should guide you into the fulfillment of that purpose. Are you still here? Yeah. So in life, we set many goals. But one goal that you did not set is the goal to be born. Is there somebody here who said the goal to be born? The person who set a goal for you to be born has other goals for you. When you leave out certain Bible-based values, you stay in the straight and narrow where the purpose of God, the will of God, can be achieved in your life. It's a wasted life that is focused only on his own or his or her personal will alone or personal purpose alone. Have you even asked God? And people say, how do I know the purpose of God for my life? There are certain ways you live. You will be walking into his purpose directly. When you are value-driven, you cannot go off the rail. Yeah. It's like wanting to get to Lagos mainland from the island and you get on the bridge. If you stay within the boundary of that bridge and you don't go off into the lagoon, into the Lagos lagoon, you will get to mainland. Am I saying the truth? And many people are asking, where is the mainland of my life? The mainland of your life is to stay on the bridge. <laughs> yeah. Be value-driven. In the midst of all that, you will make discoveries. As a church, these are our scriptural-based values that we call Ashley. If you go into Tech High, the Elevation Church Institute, where we integrate people, after you've done our membership class, you will be more schooled in these core values. But I want, this is not a suggestion. This is uh, uh, more of, beyond the recommendation, it's almost a commandment for us as a church. This is how we live. This is what makes the Elevation Church the kind of church that you want to be a part of. And our church is not a building. It's all of us. We can't leave this out as a people and this nation will not change. Am I saying the truth? Accountability, for instance. The willingness to take responsibility and be sub subjected to scrutiny. So in this church, i said it over and again, our leaders are here. There's no question that these leaders cannot ask me. Yeah. We have an open door policy. Yeah. I mean, Pastor Samson is one of our leaders in this church. He met me after first service. PG, can we hang out this week? And I said, oh, yeah, maybe tomorrow night or Tuesday, you know, because I'm traveling in the course of the week. And when we sit down and talk like that, there's, there's no question you can't ask him. Yeah. There's no question I can't ask him. His wife is there beside him now. His wife knows that I can ask him any question. What's going on here? What's go and that's how we roll. Yeah. When I'm talking to our leaders, there's no off-limit. Yeah. That's why people can put their heart into this thing, because they know this is not Godman's ministry. This is the church of God. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. We have leaders today that cannot be queried. They still have the mentality of the olden days. You know the, the word we use for a king in Yoruba language? Yeah, it means unquestionable. KBAC actually means unquestionable. So somebody, a human being, when anybody is greeting him, unquestionable. <laughs> and to manifest the fact that it's unquestionable, he will just come to your house, see your daughter and say, I put my leg on her. Let her follow me. Since nobody can question me. Yeah. Have you read our history before? They possess things and people. Unquestionable. It cannot work in this century. Yes, we will question you. Yes, we will ask you questions. Yes, and there are some young men here in your home. You are unquestionable. That is not scriptural. Yeah. That is not scriptural. <laughs> it's not. It's not. You cannot be unquestionable. Even in the days of Jesus, they ask him questions. Ask him questions. You can't be unquestionable. Yeah. You are not. <laughs> glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. Oh, I, I wish I had time. David messed up in the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan the prophet went to meet him. The moment Nathan said, 
told him a story, a parable. Ah, David knew that. Ah, he's the Bathsheba. Oh, Bathsheba. The daughter, I mean, the, the wife of Uriah that he slept with. Immediately, he didn't say, hey, I'm king. I can take anybody's wife. I can do it. David said, I have sinned. I'm not on question. And, you know, God dealt with him quite all right, but his throne was not taken from him. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Another of the value is service. Selfless commitment to create and add value. Just the willingness to want to add value all the time. Commitment to adding value. Service, which is the pathway to greatness. Today we have people who don't want to serve anybody. They just want things to fall on their laps. That is not kingdom. That is not Christ-like. At any given point in time, you should be asking yourself the question, who am I serving? Who is God sending me to? Who uh, uh, is being sent to me? How can I serve the kingdom of God through the ministry of my church so I don't be an onlooker in the kingdom of God? And we we serve at home, we serve in church, we serve in the community, we serve in our industry. Your service life must be broad-based. Let God feel you in his house. Let your family feel you at home. Let them feel you in your industry as a major contributor. That is the life of Christ. Another value we have is humility, which is power under control. You see, the devil came to Jesus you have the power to turn stone to bread. Do it. Jesus said, no, this is, humility is power under control. Yeah. That I, don't, I, don't, I don't flaunt my power. You know, in church, we use mouth, <laughs> just lip service, to say we are humble. Yes, yeah, somebody will come to church, park a car in the car park, and look very well, look at the car beside Make sure that no, no, no one doesn't scratch this one. Oh. This one is not your mate. It's not your mate. You know, keep me well. And the way the person will even walk out of the car, you will know. Arrogance and pride is re- written all over. Yeah. And you come, we we'll all lift up holy hands. Yeah. See, the person who drove to church and the person who jumped on a cab or even a motorbike to, before God were all the same. Yeah. Were all the same. Maybe you work a little harder. Maybe you work a little longer. Maybe the favor of God is upon your life, but you must understand that should not get into your head. Yeah. Life is not simply material. It is spiritual. Yeah. It's not material. It's not material. Glory be to Jesus. So it's power under control. Moses was a judge, the meekest man that ever lived. And the Bible says, the meek will inherit the earth. We want to be a people humble, you know, meek, willing to subject ourselves to God. Another uh, uh, value is love. You know, it's Ashley. It's an acronym. It's love. Love, unconditional commitment to the well-being of others. Yeah. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. This is the first and most important of all the commandments. And when our decisions are guided by these values, you just ask yourself, this is what I want to make. Does it show love to this person? Yeah. Does it show that the love of God is in my heart? If I send this email about, I'm about to send, yeah, does it communicate that I have value for another human being with this, the way I consulted it and the name that I've given them in that email? So you slow it down. You communicate your displeasure without reducing the value of another human being. Yeah, that's how love drives us in our daily dealings. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. I'll just two more. Another one is integrity, which is the high in our Ashley. Yeah, integrity, consistency, and honesty. No hypocrisy. Who you are in the morning is who you are at 1 a.m., at midnight. Because some people, who they are at midday is different from who they are at midnight. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But that consistency and honesty is a life of integrity. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. All through the Bible, the Bible is replete with people who live a life of integrity. Daniel was one of them. Yeah. Faithful, responsible, trustworthy. 
And the last one is excellence. The willingness to go the extra mile to deliver superior value consistently. That's what we try to do as a church. We're thinking everything around us. Uh, you know, uh, we, we say excellence is not a destination, it's a journey. It's the ability to do, to stretch, to do it a little better, a little better. You cannot leave, I mean, be a part of the Elevation Church and not have a knack for excellence. You should. And when you come around here, please judge us by these values. Some were, were doing extremely well. Some were still coming up to speed. It's the responsibility of everyone that is joined to the Elevation Church to make sure that this church runs with the core values that is in our DNA. And then for all of us to carry it, take it home, take it into our neighborhood, take it into our offices, and live out this. So in our quest to achieve bonding, to, to, you know, to acquire great position, to acquire money, to acquire resources, can we decide that we're going to be guided by these scriptural core values. Yeah. Because that's what makes you a part of the Elevation Church. Not your Sunday attendance. Not your Sunday attendance. Not even your membership uh, <laughs> uh, number. No. Because you can have a membership number and in heaven you are not a member. Because you, you, you have made up your mind that the values that drive this church will not be your values. And these values are scripture-based, like I said. Glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. How somebody is going through this week, rethinking what drives your life. Yeah. And what values you must pay attention to and bring to center stage. And can I ask for somebody here today that you take some time out after this service to just think about how you are doing with some of these values. Just, just think. Just think. Because that thinking will give you a sense of commitment to turn some things around. Because without it, you are living in assumption. Yeah, you are living in assumption. Integrity does not jump at people. You invest to become a person of integrity. Yeah. You catch yourself and ask the Holy Spirit to move you in the right direction. Philippians 2 and verse 13, the Bible says, For it is God that is at work within us to will and to do of his good pleasure. That God is the person that we keep in introducing and reintroducing to ourselves every time we gather together, whether here in church, in small groups, as we do life together, all over the place. And let me say this lastly before we pray. For everyone joining us online and everyone in this room right now, church begins tomorrow, not today. Yeah. How do I mean? Church is not a place you go. It's a life you live. It's the life of Christ. And some people come into a church like this and feel like, um, you know, like somebody I was talking to recently who said, oh, I attended your church once, but I just thought my needs can't be met there. You know, in my mind I was thinking, do you have special needs? <laughs> yeah. Because my needs can't be met there, you know, and all that. Some people come to church on a Sunday morning like this, and you judge a faith community, a church like this, with your Sunday attendance like this. You are like somebody, because that's the picture the Holy Spirit gave me when I was talking to that lady. You are like somebody who visits a house. You enter into the sitting room, the living room, and you judge the entire house based on the sitting room. You didn't think that there's a dining room there. In fact, there are two or three dining rooms serving different cuisines. Yeah. There's a phone room where you have games. There's a home theater, cinema, somewhere there. There's a basement where you can play table tennis and all, in the same house. But you stayed in the living room. And you say, hey, is this what they're doing here? Uh, this church is bigger than what you see on a Sunday morning. Yeah. All through the week, ministry is happening. Yeah. People connect. Classes are going on. People are being discipled. All kinds of things are happening. Yeah, men are connecting, women are connecting, young people connecting, all kinds of things. As I'm talking to you right now, the junior church is, is booming. Yeah, we have online stuff for, 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 for children. We have all kinds of classes, our preteens uh, uh, module, discipleship module. I've forgotten what, what, what we call it. I, I don't know anything about this church. Yeah. 
I struggle with some of the things. There's a name, this module for preteens that prepare them for adulthood. You can be in this church and you have a preteen and you didn't send them for that discipleship program. It's mainly online. Yeah, it's for 13 weeks or something like that. I've heard all kinds of powerful things through it. If you just come in on Sunday and go, you don't integrate, you won't know about all these things. Yeah. You won't know there's a dining room where you can eat something more than what is served here this morning. Yeah. That's how it is. So I'm asking that you join us to live out our values, but much more than that, it's time to reconsider how you integrate fully. So if you're online and you're just streaming, you're a streamer. If you want to be a part of the Elevation Church, join the online church. Yeah, we thank you for streaming our service. You have enjoyed the word, but if you want to really be a part of the Elevation Church, it's time to ask us questions. Our people are online there. We have a pastor for online church. They have small groups online, different things that you can be a part of. That's what we want you to do and live out our values with us. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. Have you been blessed today? As we pray right now, the first prayer that I want to pray is for someone to receive Christ. This is all about Christ. It's all about Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And the fact that the hold of sin is broken over our lives and we are children of God, we have been made righteous by Christ and we need to come into a relationship with him. That's where we start from. And the Holy Spirit showed me a picture of someone in this service. I don't know whether you are here or you are online. You are right at the edge right now. Look at me. Look at me. I'm at the edge of this thing. This is where so I saw it in a flash in my spirit. This is where somebody is right now. The message of today is to bring you a divine awareness that you're too close to the edge. And move back into the mainstream where you can be value-driven. But it starts with you having a life in Christ. Staying at the edge is too dangerous for your life. And some people just have a way of flirting with the edge all the time. If somebody is here today, you are not sure that you are saved. You don't know if Jesus comes today, whether he will say, well done, join me in my Father's kingdom. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. If guilt... It's so strong in your heart. You can let go of that gift by surrendering it to God right now by prayer of rededication. Maybe you have been saved before, but you backslid into sin, and the devil is using guilt and condemnation to hold you back to certain bad behavior or certain things that keep separating you from God. You can also just let go of that and say, Jesus, I want to rededicate my life to you. So whether you are here or you are online, can we just bow down our heads for a minute? And I want to ask, please bow down your head for a minute. I want to ask, if you want to say a prayer with me, whether to give your life to Christ or to rededicate your life to Jesus, can you just lift your right hand above your head? I'm going to pray for you right now. Lift your right hand above your head. Wherever you are in this auditorium, just lift your right hand above your head. I'm going to pray for you right now, right now. Right where you are. Right where you are. Right where you are. Right where you are. If your hand is up, I want you to lift it well. You're lifting it to God as a sign of surrender, not to man. So lift it where you are. And if you don't mind, can you just stand, stand, join me and stand. Stand where you are. Just stand where you are. And let's pray together. Just stand. Remain where you are, but stand. Remain where you are, but please stand. Whether you are in front, you are at the back, it doesn't matter. Just remain where you are and stand. If you are online, go to the chat room and, and, and please uh, drop, drop a message there saying, I want to give my life to Christ or I want to rededicate my life to Christ. Yeah. If you have been saved before, but you know you backslid into sin, guilt and condemnation is really holding your heart back. This is the time to, to let it go and let God have his way in your life. Uh, our officials are online and they will attend to you the moment you make that comment. For everyone standing right here in the room, I want to pray for you. I want you to say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I ask that you forgive me my sins. I accept your sacrifice on the cross as a payment for my transgression. Today, wash me with your blood. Fill my heart with your spirit. I accept you as my Lord and my personal Savior. Give me a new beginning, Father. Thank you 
for accepting me the way I am. I declare that I'm a child of God. I'm born again. The love of God is now releasing my heart in a new dimension. I will live my life for him the remaining days of my life, achieving his own purpose, not just my purpose. Thank you, Father, for accepting me. If you just said that prayer with me, I want you to just uh, follow our officials that are closest to you. They're going to lead you towards the back. They're going to spend a few minutes with them and be back with us in the service. They want to exchange uh, information with you and also put some materials in your hand that will help you to grow in your faith. Come on, somebody. Put your hands together and celebrate Jesus. Can we all rise, please? Can we all rise? If you don't mind, can we all rise? Everyone online, can we all rise? Can we all rise? Can we all rise? Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. I want you to lift your two hands to Jesus. And say, Father, help me, help me to live by your word. 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 That my choices will not be determined just by my capacity, but subject to your authority. Let that be your prayer right now. Father, help me to live by your word. Whether you are in this room or you are online, lift your voice right now. Make a fresh commitment to live by God's word. The Bible says it's the one that's at work within us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Will you subject your heart to him today and say, Father, help me to live by your word. I want 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 to live by your word. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, not just by meeting my needs, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to make money with, by your word. Following your word. Living within the guardrail. I want to fulfill my destiny. Following your word. Let that be your prayer right now. I want to live by your word. I want to live by your word. Will somebody pray right now? Say, Father, strengthen me in my innermost being to live by kingdom values. Ephesians 3, verse 16 and 17 says, I pray from his glorious unlimited resources. He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. New Living Translation said, He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit that Christ will make his home in your heart. As you trust in him, your roots will grow down into God, into God's love, and keep you strong. Let that be the prayer of your heart today. Say, Father, help me to understand you more. Walk within me to align my life with your word. I want to make a commitment to live according to value, to be driven by these values. Walk within me, Father, by the help of your spirit. Walk within me, Father. Walk within me, Father. I subject my heart. I release my heart to you afresh. Make it pliable in your hand. With somebody last day today, pray concerning certain things that you know may have been driving you. Somebody is driven by anger. That anger has become so strong. You don't mind your marriage breaking because you are angry. Will you pray to God today and declare the hold of the anger is broken over my heart in the name of Jesus? Somebody is driven by hurt. You are so hurt, you are willing to walk away from everything. Will you pray today, Lord, let this heart not be, not, not be the only thing that drives my heart. I want you to pray. You know, you know the one thing or two things that may be having dominion over you, that may be driving your decisions, that are contrary to the will of God. Somebody needs to pray today. This heart to meet my sexual needs will not destroy my future. Pray about it right now. Submit it to God. Submit it to God. This insatiable thirst for money will not destroy my destiny. I want to be a disciple of Christ. I want to be uh, driven by the values of Jesus. Tell him this morning, everyone online, tell him this morning, Lord, I release my heart to you afresh. Purify it. Work on it. Let it be open to your values and not mine only. And not just whatever I want. Thank you, everlasting Father. Wave your two hands to him, everyone. 
everyone in the room and just bless his name. When we lift our hands, it's time of our surrender to him. We're saying, carry me, Father, on eagle's wings. Carry me, Father, on eagle's wings. Walk in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. Let my life not just be about me. Let it be about you, your purpose, your plans, and your original intention for my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. In the precious name of Jesus. So I declare over you today as you step into a new week, your steps shall be guided. You will not go outside of God's agenda for your life. May the will of God be done in your life consistently. My God will work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. In the name of Jesus. Whatever corrupts the heart, whatever limits the expression of God's plan over your life, today we stand in agreement of faith with you and we declare that the effect of that is broken in the name of Jesus. Anger, animosity, hurts will not destroy your destiny. Somebody receive grace to forgive today. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Somebody receive grace to walk away from what is destroying your heart. In the name of the Lord Jesus. The God who helped Jesus to overcome temptation, it will help you this season. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Anyone who may have fallen badly to temptation will decree over your life today a season of restoration. My God restores you. My God restores you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, anyone drowning in temptation will receive grace upon you today. You are lifted in the name of Jesus. I said you are lifted in the name of Jesus. So step into this week with fresh clarity. Enjoy the help of the Spirit of God. Enjoy good counsel this week. In the name of the Lord Jesus. My God will send you good counselors this week. Amen. This week, receive grace to submit yourself to good counsel. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Amen. as you read the Bible this week, enjoy revelation knowledge Amen. that will bring revolution into your life. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. I decree peace of God upon you. Amen. Peace when you go out. Amen. Peace when you come in. Amen. Nothing missing, nothing broken. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout a better amen today. Amen. Hallelujah. If you are blessed, put your hands together. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Glory to God. Please, you may have your seat.